Yo, good morning. What's what's going on, people? Welcome to the Alchemical Mindset. And today we're going to have a little discussion concerning what is the most oppressive, the most subjugating thing in the black community. What's holding us down? What's keeping us from being great, as we say? Now, if you're on this channel, if you're on Coach Ren's this Facebook Live, please share this video. Share this video, share this video. Thumbs up, like the video, or share the video. Share it to your pages. Uh, when this gets transferred over to YouTube, subscribe, become a member, thumbs up it, do all that stuff. TikTok, you gotta come over to YouTube or my Facebook group in order to get the whole thing. But here we go. What is the most oppressive state the most subjugating thing that occurs within the black community. I'm gonna tell you what's the most oppressive, what's the most oppressive and the most subjugating thing that's currently going on in the black community and how we can overcome it and what we gotta do. Now first, let me go ahead and just say this. And this is gonna ruffle a lot of feathers. But the idea that black people in America and for the majority of the, of the Western world, majority of the world period, are, are being directly oppressed by another group of people is bullshit. It's not actual factual. Yes, are there system is there systematic racism broadly across Western culture and across this world? Sure. But even with that systematic racism, we are in a condition today unlike those of our ancestors where we actually have more control to be able to change this mindset the sad part about it is that, yes, we can point back to the systematic racism, the brainwashing, the conditioning that our ancestors went through that has been perpetuated into today. But the mere fact that we have the know, the knowledge, the understanding to take wise steps to change that, and we don't, is a sad statement. But there's one thing. There's one thing that continues this oppressive mindset in the black community that keeps us from taking the small little steps that it takes to change who we are, how we function, our power position in this on this planet, right? So sure, we can look at police, we can look at school systems, we can look at all these different things, but if we make these small steps, these small things, if we change this small thing, we can change the whole game. We can change the whole game, yes. Our people were brainwashed. Our people were beaten. Our people were um, oppressed based on their skin tone, their skin color, based on their melanation. All these things happen. That's true. That is true. Uh, we've been, our, our countries have been colonized all over the world. And the sad part is that we adopted this Western mentality, this, this foreign mentality, this foreign way of life, and every time we develop anything culturally our own in most of the countries that we exist in, especially America, it is usurped by the, that Western culture and homogenized into this group thing, which continues to not allow those, especially in Europe and America, to not be able to connect. You see, one of the differences between those who are in Botswana, those who are in Rwanda and Ghana, those in Brazil, uh, they have a culture that they maintain, a culture that is still uh, Afrocentric, if you will. And we can use a lot of different terms, Aboriginal, Black, but we all get the point. They still have a cultural thing that binds them together. In America, we don't have this. We don't have this in America. We don't have a cultural thing that binds us together. Everything that we call black culture becomes Western culture. It's usurped and we let we allow it to be usurped like that. But here's the state of mind. Here's the thing, because I'm not going to make this a long video. And every time I say that, it winds up being 25, 45 minutes. Even though I'm on a 45 minute drive. Here's the thing, because I want to go ahead and get into that thing right now what flag is that Otto uh, if, if, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, wrong but Otto A-T-O what flag is that I'm curious because I can't see it that well 
without my reading glasses on. <laughs> but religion is the most oppressive thing in the black community. And I know that's going to put a lot of people up in arms. Because they love their Jesus. They love their Allah. They love their Yahweh. Their Jehovah's. You know, they love them. They cherish them. They live, breathe, and die by them. Oh, Ghana, which is one of the countries I'm looking at moving to. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I like saying people's names right. I think it's disrespectful when you say someone's name wrong. But Ghana is one of the countries that I'm looking forward to visiting next year and live and moving to within the next five years. But, so, religion. Here's the thing. No one, no black person, no person of melanated skin tone who is Jewish, Christian, or Muslim can dispute, can truly dispute the fact that their ancestors only became, got conditioned into this religion based on some form of force. You can say all day right now that I love, believe in Jesus because of my personal relationship and my personal experience so can a Muslim person say the same thing about Allah so can a Hindu person say the same thing about Brahma or Krishna so can anybody of any religion make the same claim and you have to question if, some, if people can make that same claim of every religion then yours is not so special then evidently it is a personal experience that you have given credit to that religion but if you go to the heart of the matter go back, go back, go back, go back go back, go back, go back you will get to a point where either someone held a sword to your ancestors neck and said you will convert and believe and worship Allah or somebody held a whip or a gun or a knife and said you will worship Jesus somebody held a weapon Somebody held an advantage over you, over your ancestors, and beat it into them, forced them into it. Hell, there are instances where taxation was used, especially throughout areas like Ethiopia and Egypt, where taxation was used. So financial force was used to convert people over. Government policies were used to convert people over. The so-called five civilized tribes of Native American, Aboriginal people in America, only became that so that they can have access to the government privileges, have land, have their reservations, and be accepted by Western culture. It was all financial. They didn't convert, and they had to convert to Christianity to be considered these five civilized tribes. I said, um beat places and move oh best place to move to sir you may have already oh yeah yeah I'm definitely moving to Ghana Ghana is one of the places that that mama say is definitely on the list but we've um this religious thing and I'm gonna get to why it's still so oppressive in our in, in our culture and and what what simple things and, and I'm gonna demonstrate why it's still you being used as, as a form of oppression but you can never if you really think about it Really think about it. You're only that religion because you were born into a family that taught you that. Or you were in a religion, some negative crap was happening, and you found some positive stuff over in this other religion. But even in that other religion, what you claim is positive stuff, you just transferred your emotional need that you had in one religion over to another religion. You transfer what you was trying to grab from the outside of you and move it to another religion where you're still trying to grasp it from the outside of you. Because you've been trained to look outside yourself for your divinity, for your solutions, for your joy, your happiness, for your heaven on earth. You've been told to look outside yourself. But the worst part of it is that in these oppressive religions, they taught the people they were oppressing 
that they are the suffering servant, that they are the ones who are supposed to suffer here and then wait for glory later. That earth is not your home, that this is not where you belong, that heaven is your home. Yet they're getting all the heaven right now. And then they tell you that those who are evil, those who usurp authority, those who are money hungry and all that kind of thing, they might be getting their heaven here, but they losing their soul. And you don't want to lose your soul. I literally have had people in my lives who were in their 70s and 80s who came to a realization that that was bullshit and, and, and felt so bad about the fact that they remained poor threw away opportunities to become financially independent because they thought that if they got rich, they would lose their soul. They taught you how to oppress yourself so that they no longer needed whips. They no longer needed uh, swords. They no longer needed to mass murder people. Think about it. The Roman Empire realized that by establishing, by 480, realized by establishing Christianity as the only religion in the uh, in, in the in the in the empire, that they no longer would need the armies to control the people, but they would control the people through the pope, through the papacy. This is what Rome realized, and you think that lesson has not continued. So when they read the Old Testament of the the Hebrew Bible, and it said that you can go to other nations and make those people your slaves for life and you can transfer that ownership to your children that when they came to America when they came and they enslaved the people here when they went to Africa and enslaved the people there when they went to India and enslaved the people there and mind you they some of these people they moved around and enslaved them in other countries and passed them down for generations and they justified it with their book when the Mormons taught that a black person can only be if they do go to heaven, they will only be a servant to a white person in heaven. This is what they taught. You. This is what they teach black people. This is why they oppress you. But sadly, sadly, they also would find the black person in that community. And they would elevate them to being the pastor, the priest, the imam. And they would tell, let that black person continue to teach the slaves continue to teach the oppressed people how to be oppressed and that's what's going on in our churches and mosques and, and, and temples today is that you're still being taught to be to, to to be oppressed let me give you a simple simple solution an example of why you're still being taught that The, one of the reasons why manifest destiny happened. Now, people focus on manifest destiny as white people taking the Bible and saying that we got to spread across America and teach Christianity. But it was mainly about giving generational wealth to the white people that was on the east, you know, that was in the colonies of America. They went across and just got, got land. Land was the thing that they knew would create generational wealth. This is why after the Civil War and during Reconstruction, at first when black people were able to buy land and buy farm, and some did, some, I mean, my, my family in Carrollton, Georgia, has a lot of land that we've owned that's been in our families since the Civil War ended. And then of course, the reclaiming of the South through the KKK and other uh, Jim Crow laws and that sort of thing. A lot of people lost their land. We still have ours, but a lot of people lost their land. Land, home ownership is key. It's key to your advancement. Very key. But when you look at the black community, only 31% of the people own the home that they live in. Own the home that they live in. And I'm going to say out of that 31%, out of that 69% that's left over, maybe 10% don't care to own a house, don't even want to own a house. And I'll, I'll, I'll slide them out, slide them on out, right? Because for a long time, I was one of those people where I, I've owned houses before and I didn't want to buy another house because I didn't want to be locked in to any location. So I'm going to say 10%, generous 10% don't have a desire to own a house. But 
you go into a church and you got about 59% of the people in that church who desires to own a house. But yet they don't. Yet their pastor doesn't teach it. And, and before somebody speaks out on here in the comments later, days later, weeks later, months later, and says something like, oh, well, in our church, our pastors talks about home ownership. We have a seminar every year where our pastor talks about home ownership. Let me ask you a question. If talking about home ownership for one week out the year, one day out the year, having a seminar, having a group come in one time a year makes such a big ass difference, then why don't they only talk about tithes one time a year? Why they only why don't they only talk about tithes one week out the month? One week out of the year, rather. Why do they talk about tithes every Sunday? Every Sunday, Saturday, whatever day you go and worship. Every day you go into that building, why do they talk about tithes? Every time they have a program, why do they always take up an offering? Why do they talk about tithes and read the same damn scripture about bringing your tithes to the storehouse every damn Sunday? Because they know that repetition is what changes the mind. Repetition is what teaches the mind. Repetition is what going is what's going to galvanize the people to do something. And what they want you to do is give that money. Why do they not talk about how the Bible said told Saul to go and kill all the men, the women, the old people, all the animals, and kill all the women that known the man, but don't kill the women that didn't, but the young women that didn't have never known the man keep them and take them as your wives they may never talk about that or may talk about that one time but they will never talk about that repeatedly but they will talk about how you're supposed to be down here suffering and taking in your woes and know that you got jesus behind you and that god got you and that your home is not here and there's a home waiting for you on the other side and all you got to do is be patient be strong stand in the lord they'll tell you that over and over again because they know that whatever they say repeatedly it's what's going to affect you. And they never want you to get out of the suffering servant mentality. Because if you ever, ever leave the suffering servant mentality, then their fear is that they will lose their times. And the dumbass thing about it is that if pastors realize that if they turn their church into a place where they not just talk about prosperity, but the people actually are prospering, they would actually make more damn money in the tithe. Because then the actual verses that they read that says that I will, I will, if you tithe, then I will make your shit, I will shake it and it'll pour, be running over and all that kind of stuff. If you actually move the people in a direction where they are making money, they own their homes, they control their environment, their communities. They weren't suffering. They can get some heaven on earth. They probably tied even more because you've given them a realistic opportunity to see the damn book in action. But here's the simple part. Here's the thing. They pastors know people don't want to do no damn work. People don't want to work. They don't want to do They don't want to take the effort. They don't want to do the labor that it takes. Simple solution, home ownership. 69% of the people in the black community do not own their homes. And out of that 69%, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure the majority of their asses go to some church, mom, something like that. Right? So, if you, in five years, in five years, the black community can own the homes that they live in. Which means the black community would then own the taxation, they will own the school district, they will own the police, they will own the poli the politics in that community. In five years, that's all it takes. And five years is being generous. Really, you can get it done in two years. Two years. Black people tend to complain about how uh, folks, people from foreign countries come to America and then within seven years, they own a damn house, they own a whole damn community. They complain about that. They complain about how uh, I'm near this area, Buford Highway. How if you travel up Buford Highway, it's it's Asian, and then it well I don't know what Asian variety it is first, but it's Asian, and then it becomes Spanish, and then it becomes Vietnamese, and then it becomes Korean, right? I know those distinctions as I go further up it. They they complain about how you can go to certain areas and it's a whole big Nigerian community over there, 
And they own the damn houses. They own the stores. They own the businesses. But what they don't realize is that many of these people, they come over. And if it costs them $2,000, $3,000 to live. And they making $3,000. They're making $1,000 more. They saving that money. They building their credit. They putting themselves in position to be able to buy their house. Now, the majority of people walking around got bad credit or poor credit. They're running around, hanging out in the low 500s, some in the mid 500s, low 600s. You can have your credit score above 580 within like three to six months. Three to six months, that's all that part takes. Once your credit score is above 580, you qualify for FHA loan, which means that all you have to have is 3.5% down. 3.5% down. Meaning that if you want a $200,000 house, if the house costs $200,000, uh, which is a decent house in, in most black communities in, in, in Atlanta, you ain't going to Alpharetta with that. But a $200,000 house, you need $7,000. $7,000. And the fact of the matter is, if you... We're serious about it. If the pastor every week, if every week the pastor says, y'all, we know we're saving our money. We're saving 10% of what we make. 10% of what you make need to be put away to buy your house in two years, in three years. We on the house buying program. And if he said it every week, if they said it every week, he, she said that shit every week. Guess what the people in his church would start doing? They start taking that 10% and they will start saving it. And they'd keep on saving it. They'd be talking to each other. That's the same way when they walk out the church and they talk about, oh, there's a blessing coming. You got a blessing coming. That God has told me and showed me and shout out that you got a blessing coming. They'd be walking at that church saying, I saved my 10% this payday. I put my 10% up. You put the girl, we gonna get our house. We gonna get our house. I remember this pastor, I was at this church. This was like eight, nine years ago. And this pastor just doing this sermon, talking to, telling these women that your husbands are coming. I know I can see it. All you single women, stand up. Y'all beautiful. Your husband is coming, but I need you to go and clean your house. Organize your house. Get yourself ready. Have everything organized. Prepare for that man. So that when he come and he meet you, he see the wife that he's going to have. And all these women, single women, was walking out of the church. And for weeks, they talking about, I'm cleaning my house. I'm organizing my house. He talked about this for like three weeks in a row. And every week, they just talk about how they gonna, their house is getting clean and how much they not organized and how much they not purged and all this kind of stuff. And for weeks, because he talked about it for like three weeks, these women were talking about it for three weeks. And they were taking action for three weeks. And hardly any of them got their husband. But... They was doing that damn thing. That's how the mind works, though. If you're told something over and over and over again, that's what you're going to perpetuate in your life. And sadly, what's suppressing black people is that we're told over and over and over again that this ain't your home, that you ain't supposed to have heaven here, that heaven comes later, that you are a suffering, serv suffering servant. That you just got to lean on God and let God handle it. That when somebody does something negative to you, let God handle it. That if you're going to receive some favor, that it's going to fall like manna from heaven. But you got to realize, even in that, that in, in that allegory of a story, the manna fell, but the people still had to go pick that shit up. They still had to go grind it into a meal. They still then had to build ovens, light up, create a fire. They still had to bake it and make it into a bread. You see, they still had to put down some work. But the pastors know, the priests know, the imams know, y'all ain't gonna, most people ain't gonna put down no work. But think about that. Just the simplest thing of buying a home. Buying a home. And yeah, I said it's simple because it is. It's simple as hell to buy a house. It is. I don't, I don't want a house right now. I don't want a house right now. I'm investing in another business right now, so I don't want a house right now. But next year, around this time frame, I'm going to buy a house because there's a few investments I'm making this year, and then next year, I'm going to make an investment into buying a house. And I'm actually going to make an investment into buying a few houses uh, for next year. But, and 
one of those and I will be making an investment to buy a house in Ghana I, told, I don't know if you're still here um, but because I'm looking at this city of Pom Pom in Ghana to buy a house uh, but it's so simple to buy a house like I said if your credit is above 580 all you need is 3.5% down to buy a house and get an FHA loan once your score is over 620 then you quali you you qualify for a lower um, down payment and then there's down payment assistant progr assistance programs so that you can have your mortgage and you have your down payment um, lien and they're usually combined together in your payment or they can be separate but it still is a lower amount you can if you've never bought a home there are first time buyer initiatives and programs out there to help you buy a house but the fact of the matter is in a year you can have your credit score up to 680 700 where you're paying a lower interest rate all it takes is the work but when have you had a pastor for every i challenge i hope and i, 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 I let me say it like they said i hope and pray even though i don't pray but i hope and meditate i send the energy out that a pastor will accept the challenge of every week laying out a plan for his parishioners to become homeowners that every week when they're standing up there and either right after they ask for the they ask for the tithes or right before they ask for the tithe but every week that pastor would say all right church we're in our year of buying we're, we're in our not not year because it, it, you got to say it for longer than a year that we're in the decade of home ownership and every week just as he air because every because they're in the decade of tides but every week that pastor is telling his church that you got to save 10 percent of what you make if a person makes thirty thousand dollars a year that means they're going to save three thousand dollars a year and in five years that person's going to have fifteen thousand dollars for a down payment on a house every week he's telling those people that they got to pay their credit cards on time that you got to pay all your bills on time. You got to use the Experian credit boosting. You got to um, get you a good mix of credit. You got to have, you know, three credit cards. You got to have a, a revolving, you got to have three credit cards. You got to have a, a, a property-based, um, title-based credit card. So whether it's a, a vehicle or something like that, that you got to have a good credit mix. That we going to have, we all going to be, we all going to have 700, 800 credit scores over the next five to ten years that i challenge a pastor to say that every week and as you get your down payments as you get your credit score up so that you're paying less interest we're gonna buy the homes in this community the community that's surrounding this church we're gonna buy the homes we're gonna own the homes because when we own the house then we can own the police then we can own the school district. Then we can own the city council people. We can own the mayors. We can own every aspect. We can own the businesses. We dictate the zoning laws because we are homeowners. We are taxpayers. You see, if you're renting, you're not paying taxes. So then your voice is not heard when it comes to zoning laws in your community. Because you don't pay no taxes. You got to pay to play. And, and, and here's the logical thing I want you to think about. A lot of y'all out there are renting and you qualify for like a $1,200 a month rent, a $1,500 a month rent, a $1,800 a month rent. Y'all can, how do you qualify for a rent that's $1,200, $1,800, but you can't qualify for a mortgage that's $900? You see how jacked up that system is? Like if the mortgage industry would tell you you're not qualified for a $900 mortgage. But the rental industry will say you're qualified for a $1,500 rent. Oh, you make three times, whatever whatever the rent is, if you make three, three and a half times the rent, you qualify for the rent. You haven't had any evictions, and even if you have, there are places you can go for that. But you got all of that, but then they tell you you qualify for a rent that's damn near twice as much as what you would, and tell you you can't qualify for a mortgage. Now, I know the mortgage is a longer term commitment and all of that, but that's, that's a jacked up system if you think about it. That's a, it should be reversed. You shouldn't be qualifying for a rent that high, but you should be able to qualify for a mortgage if you make that much money. But if you're making, if you say 10% of what you make, in 10 years, you'll have your whole salary. You have your whole salary, right? 
Isn't that how that works? Ten percent, I think. Yeah. If you make thirty thousand dollars a year, if you say ten percent of what you make, you'll be saving three thousand dollars a year, and in the course of ten years, you'll have thirty thousand dollars. If you got thirty, if you walk, I don't give it. Look, if you walk into a bank or a mortgage company and you got thirty thousand dollars saved up, your credit score, and if you and if you got that kind of discipline, then your credit score can't help but be in the seven hundreds and above, and you can buy the house. But what pastor is going to tell you that? And they know, just like Manifest Destiny, they know that home ownership, land ownership is the first key to empowering the people. Owning the land. That empowers the people. This is why the British Royal Crown ensured that all the land, the territories, that they owned it. That at the end of the day, the British Crown owns the land because whoever owns the land is truly the king or the queen. So they got to own the land. This is why a lot of African nations have been kicking Chinese people out, kicking Asian people out, keeping the white people out. Because they're like, nah, we got to own the land. Our people got to own the land. Yeah, our people got to own it. Because if you don't own the land, then you can't control it. And that's the thing. Religion makes sure that you don't own the land. What else religion makes sure? Religion makes sure that you don't go against the grain. You don't go against the grain. A lot of these people in America, they vote Democrat all the time. All the time. 60 years ago, you used to vote Republican all the time. And then they'll tell you the story about the Dixiecrats coming over, taking over the Republican Party, all this kind of stuff. But in truth, what has either one of those parties done for black people? Nothing. They don't do anything. They give you a... They, they, they are of the old story of Stalin, whether it's true or not. Don't know if the story is actually true. But as the story goes, Stalin is sitting with his generals and high political people, his proletariats, and he had, grabs this chicken and he snatches all the feathers out the chicken, rips all the feathers out the chicken, throws the chicken down. It's a bloody mess. The chicken was hollering and screaming while he was ripping out his feathers. Then he takes up a bag of meal and he drops a few crumbs in front of the chicken. And then he walks away. He drops a few more crumbs and he walks away and drops a few more crumbs. And the chicken that he just bloody, the chicken that he just ripped the feathers out of, that he was the most cruel person towards follows wherever he goes and he tells his people you can batter and you can bruise and you can brutalize the people but as long as you give them a little bit of substance a little bit of a reward they'll keep following you and that's what religion does is that you're getting bloodied you're getting brutalized mentally you don't even know who you are but they give you a little bit. God's on your side. There's glory in heaven. God will never put more on you than you can bear. Which actually is incorrect. Okay, that song irritates the shit out of me, actually. You know, Kurt Franklin, you know, you do your music and everything, whatever. But you took a verse and you left out the key words to it that actually explains that. And now people have been running around for 15, 10 years or so talking about God will never put more on you than you can bear. That's bullshit. If you actually read that thing, it says that it talks about it's not that you bear it. It says it, it talks about how the God of that book would never put more on you without providing an opportunity to escape. You ain't supposed to bear it. But folks run around singing this stupid ass song quoting that as if that's correct. God will never put more on me than I can bear. I'm bearing it. I'm holding the shoulder. God is at my foundation that I'm holding up this house. I'm holding up this relationship. I'm holding up this job. I'm holding up this freaking country. No. Nothing will be on you that you don't have an escape. Regardless of what ism it is, that's life. That's life. There's always a higher vibration that you can go to to alleviate yourself from the lower end of the pole that you're existing in. Meaning, you're existing in lower income. There's always a higher vibration of additional education, entrepreneurship, that provides an escape for you from your lower income. If you have bad credit, there are vibratory things you can do to fix your credit that gives you an escape. You're not supposed to stay in bad credit and expect to get a house. This shit ain't gonna work. Expect to get a job. They're checking your credit for a job now. Well, they've been doing that. 
it's an, there's a way out. There's a way to make it change. There's a way to change it. And that's by increasing your vibration so that you move to the right side of the pole and then learning how to neutralize yourself on that side of the pole so that you don't have massive ass swings back to the left. So that you don't go from, like I used to, I used to go from making 180, $200,000 a year to making like $20,000 a year. Hell, those cup times, I ain't even make $20,000 a year. And then I swing all the way back up to making like 180, and then I swing all the way back down to making like 30. Sorry about that, shit, your phone ringing. But yeah, I would have these massive swings. And then I realized, like I knew, because I've I've been reading the damn books over and over again, been knowing it just wasn't getting it in my head, the uh, law of neutralization, that no, as soon as I see myself vibrating a little bit to the left, a little bit to the left, you start changing that vibration to get back to the right, right? You start, you start changing that. Like I kind of demonstrated that last night to someone Yesterday, I should say, to someone, whereas you know, I noticed things weren't weren't like things weren't right a little bit. Things were a little bit off. So instead of waiting weeks, months, years to to say something about things being off, no, let me let me do that immediately and let's get back. To, let's 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 see what's going on. Like, is there something going on? Is there some stress points? Like, what's going on? You know, my business is like I had a horrible day at my popcorn shop on let's see, what today's Friday. So on Wednesday. It was a horrible day. But instead of sitting there and saying like, oh, you know, let me not do anything. I was like, oh, hell no. Let me, I got to market, 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 market. Let me call some people who will put me up on their pages and, and market some more, market some more. I got my Tibetan bowl and I was, you know, meditating, getting my energy right. I was like, I'm not going to wait weeks and weeks and weeks. I got to change the vibration now. But they don't teach you in that. They don't teach you that in religion. Religion teaches you because religion. Religion teaches you to pray and hope. Pray and hope. Pray and hope. That's the other thing that is, that's, that's, that that is so suppressive to tell people to pray and hope. I remember the first book I wrote. I wrote this book called How to Escape Mental Welfare back in 2000, and I let this this gentleman read it for me. Uh, he was an executive at a at a big company, very intelligent man. He's a great guy. I mean, he's a real nice guy. You know, loving the life. The thing that pissed me off, though, is after he read the book, because I talked about a little bit of hope in the first part, he was like, oh, this book should have been just, you should have stuck with the whole hope thing. The whole hope. And I looked at him, I was like, dude, everything that, that you got in life, you becoming this, this executive that you are, is because you took action steps. You had a plan. The, my book talks about a plan of attack. My book talks about putting actions, you know, into place by higher by, by, by moving shit and getting shit done. You got stuff done to be where you at. You not moved around the country with your job in order for you to be where you at. Why would I talk about? Why you want me to talk about hope? Because that's the religious bullshit that's in your, in people's head. That's the oppression of religion when you when they tell you to pray and hope, pray and hope, pray and hope. Look. The only reason, and I can do this because I'm in no traffic. The traffic ain't moving. The only reason I got this bowl, this is not my hope. This is just to get my frequency right so that my actions move in the right direction. Right? That is the only purpose. Is to get my frequency. It's a form of meditation so that my mind can get right. So I can move in the right direction. So that my actions follow suit. That's the only reason. That's the only reason that I have this. It is not because I'm a Buddhist. It's not because I'm a Hindu, a Hindi. It's not because of any religion. It is because this is a frequency. This is a frequency. And as science has proven, frequencies equals energy, which also equals matter. And vibration is what moves you. Vibration is the action that moves you. And frequency, that energy vibrates. It has a vibratory, vibratory tone. But because religion has told you to pray and hope, hope and pray. Oh, black, we're going through this period where the cops are shooting black people. Let's hope and let's pray that God would bless this world. That God would, would, would change the minds and hearts of the people in this world. 
Now, mind you, the majority of cops are good cops. I am not saying that they're this full of bad cops. The majority of cops are good cops. But we always take the few and make that the whole. Like somebody, we, there's a black Wall Street they're trying to do in Latonia. And one lady, because there was one shooting there a year ago, oh, they always shooting people over there. No, they don't. No, they don't. Quit exaggerating shit. But we always want to hope and pray. Oh, I hope and pray that that whoever becomes president, let's, let's pray for the president, that they, they do something to heal the country. Let's, let's pray. And even the presidents be doing the same thing. We want everybody to pray. You know, this is a tragedy that has happened. You know, over here in Palestine, between the Palestinians and the Israeli, and we want America to just pray, pray that intervention comes in, that the hearts and minds. No, 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 no. Stop all this damn praying and hoping. Praying and hoping, and people say God answers prayers. If God answers prayers, then why is it that you have the majority of things you pray for have never come true? The majority, and then your excuse is always. Oh, well, you know, and y'all should be sharing this video. I hope y'all sharing these videos. Uh, sharing and thumbs up. I ain't seen no thumbs ups or nothing. Let's get some thumbs up, damn it. But <laughs> why? What, what? People are like, oh, God answered my prayer uh, when I was in this car crash and, 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 and I got and I walked away from it. Uh, why didn't you just not have a damn car crash? How about that? How about that prayer? What about the prayer that you prayed before you got in the car and you said you prayed for traveling mercies, but you had the accident, but yeah, you didn't die and you said God answered your prayer? No, if God answered your prayer, you wouldn't have the damn accident. See, you always make an excuse for God not doing what you prayed for God to do. That's because your prayer don't work. Your prayers don't work. Your actions work. You know, they say in the in the New Testament, the Christian Bible says, faith without act, faith without works is dead. But here's the funny thing. Yeah, if you have prayer and you have hope and you don't put any work behind it, shit won't get done, right? But if you don't pray and you put some action behind it, how does that shit get done anyway? It gets done, right? Work without prayer works. Work without faith works. Because faith is the, what is that? the evidence of things not seen. It ain't faith ain't the belief or the 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 confidence that you're gonna get shit done, right? Like I gotta get to my home and then get to work, and I, evidently there's an accident up here, so I don't have faith that I'm going to get to work. I know I'm going to get to work, right? I don't have faith that I'm going to open this cigar lounge. I know I'm going to open this cigar lounge, right? It's not, it's not faith. So if I do the work with the with the knowledge that I know I'm going to get this shit done, it will get done. But of course, if a person prays, oh, I pray that 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 God will allow me to um, be able to open up this cigar lounge, and I just I just pray. But you don't do shit. You don't go get your tobacco license. You don't find the location. You don't get your sign put up. You don't order your furniture. You don't get your sticks. You don't educate yourself. You don't hire employees. You don't get the uh, the place built out. You don't pass your fire marshal inspection. You don't do none of these things. And that's most stuff. But you don't do none of those things. Guess what? Your shit ain't gonna ever open. It's never gonna open. But if you go and you do. But if I don't pray, which I did not pray, I, I, I did not pray. Oh, oh. Oh, God of the universe, creator of all things, they all in all, you know, I send out my vibration that you would vibrate in frequency with me to allow for Smoking Phoenix Cigar Lounge and Smoke Shop to open. I ain't do no shit like that. I meditated so that I can have a clear vision in my mind of what I want to create, what I want to create, what I want to create, what I want to create. I meditated and got a clear vision of that in my mind. I do that on the regular. I see the customers coming in and out. I see the camaraderie of people sitting and smoking and talking and listening to music and having a good time. I see that vision. But then I get up and I do the work. You see, if you did all that praying and you don't do no work, it ain't shit gonna happen. But if you get up and do the work, it's gonna happen. But see, the subjugation of religion has got our people sitting up here praying for stuff to change. 
oh, I just pray the white man stop being so oppressive that this systematic racist system would just go away. It ain't gonna go away. You gotta make it go away. You gotta make it. You're right. People just can't, they can't put that Jesus thing down. They can't put that Allah thing down either. They can't put that, I'm a Hebrew Israelite. What's your tribe? What's your nationality? They can't put that shit down either. Right? They can't put down none of these things that causes them to look outside themselves. And the moment you tell somebody to look inside yourself for your divinity, to look inside yourself for your miracle, to look inside yourself for your manifestation, to look inside yourself for your heaven, because guess what? Heaven and hell dwells within you. It's all around you. It's in your brain. You manifest it, period. Whether you're on this existence or the next, you're going to manifest your heaven and hell. You will. People can't put that stuff down. But that is what is subjugating the hell out of people in this country, black people across this world. There are countries that's making a stride. They're making political movements. They got money. Ghana is growing fantastically. Right? Folks are moving to Ghana, buying land, setting up businesses, living a life without worrying about systematic racism. You better learn the language because you roll up into the markets, yeah, they're gonna overcharge you, but but that, that happens everywhere. That happens everywhere. When I was when I was in Israel, because they knew I was American, they was like, oh, it was five dollars ten minutes ago, but they see my happy ass come around. Oh, it's ten dollars. You know, that's just business. That's how I look at that. That's just business. You know, as there's been other countries where they barter and stuff, that's just business. But here, religion got your mind open and praying, open and praying. Religion got you thinking that you're supposed to be waiting for heaven, that you're the suffering serpent instead of you going and get your shit now. And this is why they don't have to go out and beat you into submission no more. They don't have to have a whip. They don't have to have a sword at your neck and say, either you're going to worship Allah or I'm going to kill your kids. Or I'm gonna, you're going to worship Allah, I'm going to kill your parents. They don't have to do that anymore. They don't have to put you into a physical bondage in order for you to worship them. They don't have to do, I mean, to do, to follow their worship. They don't have to do like the Roman Empire did and go across the empire and massacre anybody who did not accept Orthodox Christianity. Right? They don't have to do that. They don't have to have the Inquisitions. They don't have to have the witch trials. They don't have to do any of those things anymore. Because the sad part about it is that, and y'all gonna get mad at me. Wait, 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 let me see what I just said. Jesus ain't done nothing for us ever, but our people still can't let go of this belief, belief thing go. And let me tell you why they can't. Let me tell you why they can't. We are, and, and some people gonna get mad at the analogy, but recognize it's just an allegory, okay? It's just a thing. But it's a true experiment that happened that shows the mentality, the group mentality, the group mind. But we are 12 monkeys in a cage. Black people, melanated people around the world, except in, uh, except in some countries that's making great strides uh, on the continent. We are 12 monkeys in a cage. 12 wet monkeys in a cage. What is the 12 wet monkeys in a cage? And if I don't get no thumbs up for this analogy, I swear to Bob, I'm going to come find every last one of y'all. But anyway, I'll just find uh, But 12 monkeys in a cage. There was an experiment that was done. I don't know how long ago it was done. But there was an experiment that was done a while back. And in the experiment, you had 12 monkeys put in a cage. And then they hung a banana. And every time one of the monkeys would go up to get the banana, they'd douse all the, whole, all the monkeys in the cage with water. You know, and the monkeys hated that shit. So after, so they kept doing this. Monkey go up, grab, try to get the banana, water, water, water. Monkey try to get up, get the banana, water, 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 water. After a while, no monkeys would try to go get the banana. All of them was like, they all learned. Don't fuck with that banana. So, religion, they beat it into people. They forced you into it. They forced you into it. They beat it, they beat it, they beat it. And then, and then once everybody was subjugated and they were praising Jesus, praising whomever, they, they, they all lie, all right, you good. So then the 12, back to the 12 monkeys though. So then they would introduce a new monkey into the cage. That new monkey had never been doused with water. 
that new monkey don't know the rules. So that new monkey would go up and try to get that banana. But they wouldn't have to douse the monkey, the other 12, with water. They would snatch that monkey down and beat the living shit out of that monkey for trying to get that banana. And then that monkey, every time he tried to go get that banana, they beat the shit out of him. And every time they introduce a new monkey in there, and they that new monkey tried to go get that banana, they beat the shit out of him. And you see, when that new slave came in, when they went down across the Sahara and they grabbed some more slaves and brought them up into the Arab nation, and 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 they and that and that new slave came in talking about you know Shango and Odamare and all that. Now nah, they beat the shit out of him. The other slaves beat the shit out of him. The other slaves told him, no, 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 don't don't come in here talking that. That, that that Oshun stuff. Don't come in here talking about our African ancestors and Shango. Don't come in here talking about that. Don't don't come in here talking about the sky people. Don't come in here talking about, you know, Quetzalcoatl. Don't don't talk that shit. Cause, you know, we no, 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 no. You start talking that, and the white man gonna come in here and, and no, and they beat the shit out of them. Just like they beat the shit out of the 13th, 14th, 15th monkey. And then after a while, after then I beat the shit out of the monkeys, beat the shit out of the monkeys, and the monkeys started having babies. The babies learned from the parents, don't touch that freaking banana. Don't you touch that banana. Just like after a generation, the babies that were born under slavery, the babies that are born under Christianity, under Islam, under Judaism, don't you and somebody comes along, they start talking about consciousness. Somebody comes along, they start the they start talking about, you know, your ancestors. Oh, that's evil. They start talking about voodoo. Oh, that's the devil. They start talking about anything like that that's outside of the white person's purview. Oh no, 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 no. That's 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 evil now. You see, they ain't gotta teach, they ain't gotta beat you now. We the we we are the we are generations and generations and generations after. The wet monkeys, the first 12 wet monkeys. And yet we still are scared to touch that damn banana. Still scared to touch that damn banana. We've been told so many times, like I grew up in a community where it was it was common to hear the white man ain't gonna let you own the plan in your ain't gonna let you own this. The white man ain't gonna let you become wealthy. The white man ain't gonna let you become this. The white man, the white man, the white man, the white man. As always, the white man ain't gonna do let you do this, and the white man ain't gonna let you do that. You know what I found out? That every time I've had a business that did well or didn't do well, the white man didn't have shit to do with it. Can you, can you believe that? Can you believe that? Can you? I mean, for real. When I sold my fitness company, the white man didn't have nothing to do with that. I will say this, it was a white man that actually supported me in getting the freaking loan to open the business because they don't like giving money to a gym, you know, and I, I appreciate he was a great, he's a great mentor to me. That's why I don't do this whole racist thing. I, I, I can't stand it. But the white man doesn't have to subjugate black people because black people subjugate themselves. We'll go and talk about how we can't do something. We stuck. That's because we are 5, 10, 15 generations away from the first 12 wet monkeys. And we are self-conditioned to pray and hope and wish. We are self-conditioned to say that they ain't going to let us buy the houses in our community. They ain't going to let us own the schools in our community. Who the hell is they? If all the people in your community is black, if all your city councilmen and women are black. If all your principals are black, all, all, your, all your teachers are black, I ain't gonna say all the majority, because there's a few white people and Asian people sprinkled in there. But if all the people that you live around are all black, who's stopping you? Who's control? Who's stopping you from controlling your schools? You. Now, yeah. Let me go ahead and say it before somebody else says it. You go into the black community, you go through a neighborhood. A lot of those homes aren't owned by black people because they're renting. The homes are owned by some white people, some Asian people. They're owned by some other black people too. But that does not stop you from saving 10% of what you make every damn year. And then when you have two years of those savings plus a credit score above 580, take your happy ass and go buy a house 
Because there are houses for sale in every community. Every community. The one that you live in may not be for sale. But I guarantee you that down the street, around the corner, up the hill we go, there's a house for sale in your community. But you self-conditioned to not do it. Because you've also been taught to be consumers. You see, black people have been trained to be consumers. Integration was one of the most effed up things that could have happened to black people in America. I'm going to say in America. I don't know about other countries. But integration in America just jacked up black people. Because the moment it happened, we lost our communities. Where I, used to, where I grew up, in Marietta, Georgia, Lawrence Street was the Black Wall Street. That's where all the doctors, lawyers, dentists, uh, shopkeepers, seamstress, all those people own those businesses along that street. And black people shop, 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 shop with each other. But as soon as they opened the door, we left all those shops and we went up to Marietta Square. We want to shop with the Leader family. We want to shop with the Goldsteins. We want to shop with all those families up in Marietta. And nothing right, nothing against those families because actually I know for a fact that some of those families were helpful to some of the wealthy black people in Marietta now. Some of those families are the reason why those black people became wealthy. You know, because they took the time to teach them. But that's what we did though. We left the black businesses in our on Lemon Street, Lawrenceville, Lawrence, Lawrence Street, Lemon Street, Clay Street. We left all those black businesses and we went and shot with on, on Marietta Square because now we can go shop up there. Now we can go to Woolworth, right? Now we can go to Dunaway Drugs and sit at the soda fountain. Now we can go and shop in Leader. We can go shop in Goldstein's. We can go shop, you know, in all the little places up there. We can eat at those restaurants now. We ain't got to eat at, you know, Miss Mamie's or Strix. But now we're going to go to all those other places and get it done. You know, the only thing we kept was that damn barbershops and the hairdressers, right? But we, now we're going to go to these people and give them our money. And now those who are making money, oh, I'm about to move out here to Potter Springs. I'm gonna move, I'm moving out to that Horseshoe Bend community. I'm gonna move out to Horseshoe Bend. I'm gonna leave the black community. And I'm gonna go out here and, and, and now I wanna show them that they're gonna take my money. You bankrupt the black community by doing that. You left the black school. Marietta was so Marietta actually integrated before the Civil Rights Bill. Because they wanted those black athletes that was playing for Lemon Street High School to play for Marietta High School. That's why if you look at the state championships for Marietta High, they won a whole bunch of damn championships in the mid to er, mid and early 60s and 70s. Because they, 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 they took all them black athletes and used their butt up. So they was happy to do that. But we lost that edge, though. Because when integration happened, we should have stayed in the black community. Then Lemon Street High School would have been the one that was producing all these championships. All these doctors, lawyers, shopkeepers, business owners should have stayed there. And then that whole area, instead of it becoming a lower income, drug infested area when I was growing up, it would have been a place of home, black people homes and communities and strong family units. That's what I would have seen growing up, if not for integration. But see, that religion went with you. Because see, that religion, adopting your oppressor's religion. Think about it. Why would your enemy give you a religion that's supposed to benefit you? That, that would never happen. When I was in the Marine Corps, that would be like, that would be like when we went to Desert Storm, for me to go over to the Saudi forces and say, hey, tomorrow we're going to attack you. And when we do attack you, this, 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 this is our attack formation. This is our plan. This is, this is the whole battle plan that we have. So, you know. Okay. So, we'll see you. I see you tomorrow when we come to fight you. When we come to battle you, I see you tomorrow. All right? This is, that, you know what I'm saying? That'd be like when I was a financial fraud investigator in the Marine Corps. That would have been like, okay, there was this dude. And this one is declassified, so it don't matter. There was a guy... It was, it was a couple of guys. They were selling jets. They were selling jets, right? And I figured out how they were selling the jets and everything like that. You know, piece by piece, you sell a jet, you put it together, you sold some person a jet. Um, you know, and that would have been like me going to them and saying, hey, 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 I just want you to know that I'm investigating the fact that you guys are selling jets and that you're using, you know, the Sabre system to be able to kind of like miss, to hide the money 
and you're using the wrong, you know, different cost center codes and, you know, to order different things. And then your DR, the way you're DRMO in this, you know, I'm watching how you do utilize DRMO in order for you to dispose of the equipment to make it seem like it was just effective and whatnot. And by the way, I noticed that your you, your base only have F F16 Fighting Falcons, but you're starting to order F18 Hornets, which is like that's a red flag. That would be like me going to tell them that while I'm investigating or getting ready to investigate them. That's that's stupid. That's dumb. Right. So why would the enemy give you a religion that's supposed to be for your benefit? Like seriously, why? They would no really no one no one would do that. But we take it in. I've even heard pastors stand in pulpits and say that they thank God for slavery. They thank God for slavery. Because they say if it had not been for slavery, that they would be, and this fool said this. That they would be in the jungles of Africa, running around, half naked, worshiping demons and false deities. I was like, are you serious? You do realize that. And I told him, I said, you do realize that most of Africa was subjugated and colonized into worshiping Jesus or Allah too, right? That's the first thing you need to understand. Second thing. Most of Africa is not walking around in no damn jungle. Hell, half of Africa is not even a jungle. The Sahara Desert is huge. The Kalahari Desert is huge. South Africa has climates similar to Georgia. It's not a damn jungle. That's the first thing. And then people walk around half naked. Like, you have truly been, and I told them, you've truly been brainwashed by Western culture to believe that everything that is black is negative that even the usage of the term black and white is a racist subjective term of defining one group as pure and the other group as evil one is good one is evil one is pure and one is filthy and the fact that you would say thank god for slavery you would thank god for the brutality that your ancestors had to go through you would thank god for the rape that some of your ancestors went through. You would thank God for the mental enslavement, the demasculation of the black man. You would you would thank God for that just so that you can have your comfort in continuing to worship this false idol that was manifested by the Vespasian family through the writings of Josephus ben Mathia and then further by the Herod family and the... Um, families of Alexandria that then scribe after scribe continued to uh, elevate it and create it and manifest it into the legend that it is and then finally made legal by Constantine and then made the only religion by Theodosius who murdered 50 million people over the process of the next 100 years in order to get them to convert you, you thank God for that, for all that murder for all that rape for all that genocide so that you can believe in some heaven that only exists in your brain because there ain't no proof there's no proof that it exists as a one place the reason why the little stupid ass books say um, the peso family I, that, I, uh, I know that but I can't think of what that is right now that name comes, the Pizzo family comes in my mind for a reason. But they, um, the thing about heaven, even your book, even that book says that in my father's house, there are many rooms, right? That's why, I, which is why I don't understand why these people keep on thinking that there are many mansions in heaven. What the fuck do you need a mansion for? You're supposed to be in heaven. Why you got these earthly things in heaven? Don't make sense, right? Unless you understand the allegory of it. You have a earth-centered mind your consciousness it relates this is a car this is clothes this is a hat right so your consciousness is going to carry the memory of the experiences that you have now into your next emanation but now if your subconscious believes that you're going to go to hell you're going to have whatever whatever versions of hell whatever guilt you've experienced whatever shame and, and and fear that you're still holding on to at the time of you leaving this existence you're going to carry that and manifest that as your life your deserving life after this life 
I did a whole video about this a couple days ago, or about a week ago. No, yeah, a week ago. Uh, but you're gonna manifest that into your next understanding, your next conscious being, your next way of living. Or your ass gonna come back here and redo this shit over again, right? Uh, woo, finally got past this accident, y'all. Oh, it's not even an accident, it's just working on the side of the road. But, <laughs> Now I gotta do a little speed. I gotta get home, get back to work, and ride my motorcycle back. Got to pick up supplies. But anyway, you're gonna you're gonna exist. You don't you don't die. There's no such thing as death. But this religion got you believing that there's one place in heaven. Everything in this universe, on every dimensional plane, follows natural law. And in natural law, everything is cyclic. Everything has a cycle. Everything have a birth and rebirth, birth and rebirth, birth and rebirth. Which really I shouldn't even use the term birth. Everything just transmute from one existence to the next existence. Transmute, transmutation. Energy, transmutation, constantly. And it's psych it's cyclic. Even this universe goes from the black hole to the singularity to boom. To creating all this bullshit, our current understanding of the universe, the and then it retracts back into the black hole, then boom. Singularity happens again and it continues. It's a cycle. Over and over and over and over. Your energy will cycle over and over and over again. Your consciousness cycles over and over and over again. One existence to the next existence to the next existence. You are eternal. You are eternal. Can you conceptualize that? Can you accept that you are eternal? You are energy. And since energy can neither be created nor destroyed, and since your energy cannot be destroyed, then you are eternal. You just transmute. Now, if you're just transmuting, and if there are many mansions, there are many homes, many rooms in this mansion, then you are manifesting whatever the hell is going on in that room. To use that as an allegory, as a, as a um, not an allegory. I forgot the words I'm looking for, but to use that, you are, you, you are. If you have, there's a good movie that kind of like, shows that it called, it's Robin Williams movie What Dreams May Come Breaks it, it demonstrates that very very. it's the best movie I've ever seen that demonstrated how each person when they leave here they manifest their own big ass their own universe kind of their own world within this heavenly plane of existence that's all you're doing unfortunately a lot of y'all are walking around with fear, shame and guilt and because you're walking around with fear, shame, and guilt, that's what your ass is going to manifest into your next existence. The best that most of y'all can do, that most people can do, is come back here and try again. That's the best that most people can do. I'm just being real. A very, this is why the Buddha, this is why Krishna, this is why what the teachings of Buddha, the teachings of Krishna, the teachings of Lao Tzu, the, actually the teachings of, of Yeshua, Jesus, the teachings of... Um, you know, Oshun, the, the teachings of cross quote, the teachings of so many that are teaching you how to get into a higher consciousness, get into that Buddha head, the Christ mind. It teaches that only a few will ever get there. In alchemy, we teach that, you know, in alchemy, when you understand the, the alchemical mindset, the, 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 the priesthood, it is recognized that only a few will ever and every generation will attain that level of consciousness. Most people will stay stuck in the matrix that they're in. Whatever they were taught, that's what they're going to stay stuck in. That's why I don't get angry anymore. You know, with people. Because I realize that they got, they got to come back. That, and I, and if the best thing they can do is come back and try it again. Come back and hopefully learn more. Come back into a different family and have some different experiences. And, and, and maybe... Maybe they let go of this oppressive state of religion, of whatever religion looks like when they come back. And, and, and they realize that, you know what? There's no reason for me to carry fear. There's no reason for me to carry shame. There's no reason for me to carry guilt. I am free of all those things. So now I can elevate my ability to love, my ability to communicate, uh, elevate my, my, my third eye so that I can see the connection between all things so that I can exist without having earthly attachments and dwell at a higher conscious state. And when I do that, I ain't coming back here. I 
make the decision not to come back here. It is taught in alchemy that a few, a few, decide to come back here simply to teach people how to leave and not come back, how to elevate their consciousness. Only a few decide that. I ain't one of them few. I'm telling you right now, I'm not one of the few. After this one, I'm not coming back here. I'm done. I'm done with Earth. Earth has nurtured me as much as it possibly can, nurtured my soul, and it's going, and it's not coming back here. I decided. I decided that. I don't need a book. I don't need. I don't need Hebrew. So let me let me step on them toes too. I don't need a sar. I don't need Hebrew. I don't need a set. I don't need any of them to vouch for me. I don't need to confess the laws of my eye. My heart is not gonna be weighed against the scale of a feather so that some crocodile deity can come and gobble it up if it's heavier or so that Hiru can come and vouch for me. I don't need that. They have no power over me. They don't determine nothing about me. They don't determine where I go, how I live. I don't need, I don't need no damn, I don't need some tokens for the ferryman to cross over to the Elysium. Nah, I don't need that. I wish I would leave this consciousness and some dude named Hero come up to me and say, well, you know I gotta vouch for you. I mean, I'll whoop your ass. You better get on somewhere. I vouch for myself. I wish a crocodile god did it would come up and say, I'm gonna eat your heart. And I'm going to stomp them teeth out your mouth. I don't need you. I don't need no Jesus. Oh, well, you know, God, Father, myself. Um, I took on his sins. Dude, I ain't got no sins. What the hell are you talking about? I ain't had no original sin. And I ain't got no I don't have no sins. Because I don't feel guilty about a damn thing that I've ever done in my life. Have I made mistakes? Sure. I'm not ashamed of anything I've done. Have I done things that society may say, well, that's not what a man should do. That's not what a black man should do. That's not what a father should do. Now, I haven't hurt anybody, but, you know, have I done some questionable moral things in my life? Yeah. Have I thought some questionable moral things? Yeah. Do I feel ashamed of any of those things? Fuck no. I don't. There were thoughts. There were things I did. I enjoyed some of it. Some of it I didn't. The things I enjoy, I still do. The things I didn't enjoy, I don't. And if you don't like what I do, I don't care. <laughs> That's the thing, I don't care. Religion teaches you to care about what other people think about what you do. It causes you to feel shameful about having thoughts. If you want, I saw a dude last night. He has three wives. I guess they're his wives, I don't know. But the way they look and they look like they were Hebrew Israelites and he has three wives. Y'all need to go. Sorry, these people ain't go. Why sit at a red light that allows you to turn right, but you won't turn right? But he got three wives. Christianity will make you feel ashamed of that. The, the Mormons gave up their polygamy stance just so that they can become a part of America for tax benefits and nation and national protection. Right? They gave that up. Not because of their religion says so. So I'm telling you the key right now how you get out this shit. I don't feel shameful about nothing. The way I live my life, how I live my life. Like, I don't smoke weed. But let's say I decided I wanted to smoke weed. I would never feel ashamed about it or guilty about it. Why? It's a natural plant that grows on the earth. Hell, the times I, I even I say I don't smoke it, because I don't really smoke it. I can't be counted as a weed smoker. But generally once a year... Through a medita after a meditation process, I'll utilize that for my last three days of meditation. Because the hallucinogens opens your mind up and allows more DMT and serotonins and all that shit, you know, to go over your brain, so that you can get into a deeper um, stance, trance. I don't have a problem with anybody who does things like that. I don't even have a problem with you doing the recreation, as long as you ain't hurting nobody else. I don't care. But you shouldn't care. If you want to have three, four wives. No one should care. You shouldn't give a shit about what anybody thinks. You won't have three, four husbands. You shouldn't care what other people think. Wherever you want to live in this country, however you want to live. You want to walk around. There's a couple on my on one of the cigar pages 
they are always doing shit butt naked. They take pictures butt naked all the time, sitting on their back porch, smoking cigars, having some cognac. You can't see like the private part, but they always butt ass naked, right? I think it's cool as hell, personally. But they butt naked, and they're not in the best shape either. But they butt naked. No shame. And if they, and I don't know if they have kids, and they kids, if they kids like, oh, you shouldn't, don't have any guilt. You doing you. Do you. Don't feel guilty. Don't let nobody feel guilty about whatever you do. And when you cannot feel guilty and you're not shameful for any damn thing that you think or do, right? Then you won't walk around in fear. And by the way, let me say, if you are feeling shameful or guilty about something, if you're feeling shameful, the way to get over your shame is to go make true repentance to whomever you injured. Right? So if the only time you should feel shame about something is when you have done something that hurts somebody else. Go make true repentance about that and forgive yourself after you make the, uh, the um, repentance. You know, now, whether they accept the apology or not, whether they accept your gift, like, let's say you stole from somebody, right? Let's say you stole like $100 from somebody, something simple. Go get them $200 and say, you know what? I stole this $100 from you. I apologize. I'm truly sorry. It was the wrong thing for me to do. You didn't deserve that to happen to you. I don't know if that messed up your bills or whatever, because some people are $100 away from being jacked up. From being homeless or from being having paid late fees and all that kind of stuff. Apologize for it. Make amends for it. If they accept it, great. If they don't, whatever. And then accept the apology and the repentance within yourself and forgive yourself. You'll let that shame go. You won't feel that shame no more. And even if you gotta tell yourself you accept your own apology, you accept your that you you forgive yourself a hundred times before you can truly do it. Then do it a hundred times until you truly do it. Same thing with guilt, but now you're just doing it to yourself, right? It's now just all about self. I, you know, you know what? I worked six years where I did not spend as much time as I should have been spending with my children, right? But you know what? I did. I didn't, but I did. Still, I did spend a lot of time with them, and I still called them a lot. And we stayed, still got a lot of their life lessons from their dad. And over these last you know, three, four, three years, I spent a lot of time with my children and they have learned and we're growing and our relationship is great. I do not feel guilty about those years that I was working so hard and working so much. For years, I felt guilty about not being in the house with them, you know, but then I realized that, you know what, I wasn't in the house with them, but I still, they came to my house all the time. <laughs> you know, I never shirked that responsibility. So you let go of it forgive yourself you recognize your mistakes and you let and you forgive yourself and you make repentance you do that and you won't walk away with this bullshit you won't have this fear this guilt and then you won't have fear because now you won't be afraid of hell because you'll recognize hell doesn't exist and it's never going to be a part of your life and you'll recognize that nobody holds weight over you nobody nobody holds that over you that you are the determining factor of your life. And when you're walking around fearless like that, you see shit, you do stuff, and you don't even worry about it. You don't even worry about whether it succeeds or fails because you know that all the power within that is all in you to accomplish whatever the heck it is you want to accomplish. And, it, and whether it goes the way you want it to go or not, you make adjustments and you keep it moving. And so you don't live in fear of anything. My daughter, is my daughter here? Yeah, she's here. All right. So you don't you don't worry about none of that stuff. You just go for it, go for it, go for it. And you just keep going for it. All right? You don't live in it. And when you don't do that, then you can ascend. Too bad most people will never do that. They're going to live in fear. They're going to live in shame. They're going to live in guilt because that's what religion gives them. That's what religion has taught them to live that way. And I hope you guys, I know we, I, I appreciate y'all for hanging out with me while I drove through traffic and all that kind of stuff to to get over here um, but we gotta let religion go we gotta let religion go the only religion that should exist is the one that's inside you that's it that's why it's the alchemical mindset it's, you know alchemy is the continued elevation of bringing things to a higher pure state and it's a state of mind it's not so much about making lead into gold that's just an analogy for um, how the mental process is supposed to work 
So we got to recognize that. We got to take our mental process to gold. Get rid of the impurities. And religion is one of the most impure things that you have it, that people have in their mind. And the moment we let that shit go, then we can truly see our greatness. We can truly see who we are. And then we can elevate and not come back to this shit. And I feel bad for those who are so damned that they're going to hell. They're going to get into hell. And maybe one day while they're in their hell loop, they'll recognize how they can escape it out of that dimensional plane. I don't know how that dimensional plane works because I've never been there. And I ain't ever going there. Because this consciousness would never accept some bullshit like that. Hey, think about that. Eternal damnation. Everything is cyclic in this universe. But there's a place that's eternal damnation? That doesn't make any sense. It's stupid. It's dumb. So, anyway, guys. I appreciate you. You guys have a great day. Uh, there'll be a lot more lives on this channel. Um, so, please share it. As well as, um, you know, we're just going to be doing some things. We're going to be doing some things. We're going to be breaking down a lot of this religious BS so that we can truly elevate ourselves to a to have a God consciousness within ourselves, you know, so that your God and goddess can come together in unity, you know, and so your God and goddess can come together and truly be a life, truly give life. So y'all have a great day. Remember, you got to free yourself to be yourself because your greatness is non-negotiable, good journey, good vibration.